Thank you for the introduction. It is an honor to be here and be part of the dialogue to share about the Periodic Table of Food Initiative and our journey with it. I am going to share my slides. Okay, thumbs up if you could see that. I guess I can't see you. Okay, perfect. I can see thumbs. Perfect. Um, I am so pleased to be sharing about the Periodic Table of Food Initiative. It is managed by the American Heart Association in collaboration with SIAT in Cali, Colombia, which is the Center for International Tropical Agriculture. And I'm so excited about this collaboration. It's bringing together a leader in human health with a leader in agricultural research to really take a systems approach to addressing our food system challenges. Um, our project it has funding from several sources, including the Rockefeller Foundation, Sea Ray Foundation, and FAR, um, the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research. So as many of us in this room, or probably most of us, uh, what the Periodic Table of Food Initiative is motivated by is a broken food system. We know that food is at the center of our greatest challenges with regards to both human as well as planetary health. And what we're trying to do here is to provide evidence on comprehensively understanding what is in food, how this links to the environment, the agricultural management drivers of food composition, and ultimately the implications for human health in order to provide data-driven solutions uh, to all of our pressing societal issues with regards to food. So on the... Um, human side of the food system, the evidence that's really most compelling to us um, that I think most of us are driven by is that dietary risks are the leading risk factor for the global burden of disease, um, as well as here in the United States. And if we begin to break down that a little bit more, we understand that dietary composition is really attributable to that mortality. And when we think about what is in our diets and what is linked to that mortality, it's mostly the prevalence, the low prevalence of specific foods rather than only being the high prevalence of other foods. So this includes low prevalence of fruits, whole grains, vegetables, legumes, nuts, and seeds, and then the high prevalence of processed meats, red meats, and sugary drinks. And so we're very interested in understanding what is specifically in those foods, what are the biomolecules in those foods that are linked to those different human health outcomes. And this may be compounds with beneficial attributes as well as compounds with deleterious impacts for human health. Um, globally, we know that we're, we're in taking less fruits and vegetables than is recommended by dietary guidelines. Um, and there's many different factors uh, driving this. And part of this, as we know, is affordability. Uh, multiple studies have come out in the past few years showing that cost of healthy diets are unaffordable for many communities, specifically with regards to fruits and vegetables, as well as with uh, what we refer to as sustainable diets. And so the Periodic Table of Food Initiative in thinking about healthy diets and the cost of healthy diets, can we optimize for specific biomolecules that are in fruits and vegetables and other protective foods? Can we optimize those foods based on what is also affordable for communities as well as what is des culturally desirable and relevant? And then on the um, environmental side of the food system, we know that the food system is placing greater burden on ecosystems than any other human activity, including greenhouse gas emissions, um, as well as uh, runoffs from the agricultural system. And we also know that not all foods behave the same. So for example, fruits and vegetables, we see over here um, their impact compared to what we're seeing in red for greenhouse gas emissions, which is uh, greenhouse gas emissions linked to meat production. So we know that different foods are burdening um, ecosystems differentially as well as our bodies. Um, and so what we're really interested in understanding are the specific biomolecules in those foods that are attributable to those impacts. Um, also, when we're thinking about affordability, I wanted to emphasize it's important to not only think about affordability in terms of access and uh, the price of foods, but also the environmental costs that foods can have. Uh, we know that many of the environmental costs and externalities 
of food are actually not economically valued. And thus, we don't see those reflected in the price or feeling those in our pocket. But not accounting for the true cost of food, the cost to the environment, it actually begins to propagate a series of failures throughout the food system. And so in taking a systems approach, it's really important to also begin to account for the true cost of food, which includes those environmental impacts. And so there has been this great call for food system transformation and nutrition security um, through international efforts as well as national efforts. Um, and this is what we are responding to at the periodic table of food initiative. However, there's multiple barriers that are preventing that food systems transformation to a food system that is more equitable and healthy for all. Um, and knowledge is really a major factor that is preventing data-driven solutions. We also know that access, motivation, and behavioral change are also very critical. And at the periodic table of food initiative, we are approaching first uh, the issues and barriers related to knowledge of what is food and what is in food. Um, and some of the dietary knowledge barriers include um, a lack of comprehensive understanding on the different phytonutrients in foods uh, and their role in human health, um, the additives in food, um, the role of food processing and fermentation, and what that has and means for human health, including for the gut microbiome, and then using this information to design personalized um, nutrition and um, understanding the impacts of the environment um, and agricultural practices on food composition. So these are some of the knowledge barriers that we're seeking to address. Um, and the core of this is what is in food? What are the protective role of food biomolecules? And can we optimize food supply for nutrient density, affordability, access, and sustainability? Um, and so from the scientific literature, um, understanding and going into the lab, we see spectral data that's coming off of um, our high resolution instruments to uh, identify a huge range of biomolecules. And from those peaks that come out of our spectral data in the lab, uh, we can only identify a small portion of these biomolecules. And there's a huge range of unidentified molecules, uh, which are known as the nutritional dark matter. We don't know what these biomolecules are or what their role is in human health. And this is really at the core um, of part of what the periodic table of food initiative is trying to unravel or unlock is this unknown food composition, as well as quantitatively um, measuring the known food composition in ways that are more accessible, really bringing down the price of measuring those biomolecules and doing so in a globally standardized way. Um, other food uh, composition drive uh, unknowns um, that we're trying to address are what are the factors that impact food composition, whether this is climate change or different agricultural practices, and how can we optimize our agricultural supply for nutrient density, coupled with farmer livelihoods, the cost of production, and overall sustainability. Um, and just from some of the scientific evidence of what is actually impacting our food supply, uh, there is evidence that climate change and increasing CO2 is threatening human nutrition and impacting uh, the vitamins and mineral supply um, of foods, including legumes and grains. There is also um, a lot of evidence, uh, this is from a systematic review, that shows the impacts of agricultural practices on food composition. Uh, more specifically, this meta-analysis analyzed 343 papers from the peer-reviewed literature and found statistically significant differences between foods that were organic versus non-organic foods. And so we know that the way we manage our agricultural systems tremendously impact food composition. Yet, we have a um, huge way to go to really understand the huge range of biomolecules um, and how they are impacted. Many of these studies um, use different methodologies and are analyzing different sets of biomolecules. And so there is difficulty in comparing between laboratories. And so this is another um, gap that the periodic table of food initiative is trying to address. Um, 
So what we are is a global participatory effort to inform data-driven solutions to improve human and planetary health through robust, standardized, and participatory approaches to comprehensively measure food composition. And uh, we're really enabling other researchers and other labs to adopt these protocols to measure food composition in their landscapes around the world, and then to make this data available in an open access database that we can then add AI tools, machine learning, et cetera, to do some really fascinating data-driven uh, searches and then inform all sorts of solutions, including personalized nutrition. Um, and this is just some uh, data sharing the importance of having standardized approaches for measuring food composition. We send a range of standard reference material of different foods to uh, leading labs across the country. And what we found was that the methodologies um, that the labs used within a lab were very consistent and precise. However, across labs, we found tremendous variability. Uh, so this is just looking at Apple's standard reference material, the same exact standard reference material of Apple's sent to three different labs. And we find very little overlap in the compounds that were actually identified collectively. Only 14 biomolecules from these samples were collectively identified between these three labs, where there were several hundred, 900 total biomolecules that were named, but only 14 were common between the labs. So we begin to see this tremendous need for consistent and standardized approaches across labs for evaluating what is in food. And the time is perfect for doing this. There's tremendous enabling opportunities uh, for food omics or the application of omics technology to comprehensively evaluate food and its links to human health, um, including uh, advances and accessibility in high resolution analytical platforms, uh, high resolution biochemical libraries that are increasingly available, as well as advances in computational science, including machine learning and data integration. Um, so briefly going over our objectives at the Periodic Table of Food Initiative, uh, ultimately we're trying to create a global ecosystem of PTFI labs and institutions that will utilize these protocols that we're developing for analyzing food. We're also working to strengthen training, uh, provide training to current and future bioscientists to evaluate food composition and also to make meaning of that data to create data-driven solutions. Um, we have a growing ecosystem of PTFI research partners, including centers of excellence, service labs, other research partners. Um, and our goal also is to have one national research hub in each country on the planet. Um, these are our centers of excellence. Uh, so we have one center of excellence on each continent. And here in the United States, our center of excellence is UC Davis. Uh, for the technology and analytical approaches, our um, objective is to develop and distribute these standardized analytical protocols to evaluate food composition, and then to provide this in an open access way uh, for all, and then also to integrate this with other data platforms, including other food composition databases. Um, and then lastly, uh, for the technology is to provide tools to facilitate the discovery of the nutritional dark matter. And so for food composition, we are expanding the biochemical library of food composition databases. Uh, food contains biomolecules that are both endogenous to the crop. Um, these include uh, what is part of the species, the crop species when it's uh, growing or produced. Um, and then as it moves through the food system, there's also all of these exogenous biomolecules that enter due to agricultural practices, such as uh, chemical residues, pesticides, herbicides, also through processing, including additives. And so what we're trying to do is measure both the endogenous and exogenous biomolecules. Um, this includes those macro and micronutrients that dietitians um, currently make meaning of as well as uh, a huge vast range of secondary metabolites that are increasingly recognized to have protective effects for human health. Um, and we're starting our, this very um, ambitious project uh, 
The goal is to analyze every food on the planet, so all of the edible biodiversity, which is estimated to be more than 13,000 species. Um, again, this is a participatory effort, and so we are really, um, um, the goal is to have other labs around the world be motivated to do so using the periodic table of food approaches. Um, but we are starting um, more humbly uh, with a list of 1,700 foods that were nominated by regional experts around the world. Uh, this includes 1,300 plant species, um, 400 animal species, and one bacteria species. Um, the question I often ask is, what were the most prevalent uh, foods nominated by these international experts? Um, and the answer is on the screen here, tomatoes. Um, potatoes and onions were the most prevalent nominations we received from experts around the world. Um, most of the foods are going to be unprocessed initially, but ultimately we will also capture different processing types, um, including fermented foods um, that many indigenous communities value for their role in human health, and also um, increasing evidence for the gut microbiome. Um, we are also focused on looking at indigenous foods, uh, desirable foods, and those that are accessible to different communities. And so very much taking a health equity framework in populating the periodic table of food database. Um, so we don't only want organic, you know, high premium uh, foods in the database, but really what is accessible to different communities and what is culturally relevant to them. Um, and in working with indigenous communities, um, it will, and also with different countries, uh, we're taking into account the different access and benefit sharing issues that are associated with uh, making such data open access for all. Um, and in addition to measuring the food composition of a specific food, uh, one of the big value adds of the periodic table of food initiative is collecting a series of metadata. And the, this includes the different environmental and management factors associated with that specific food or crop. We will thus be able to then see how, um, let's say, climate is impacting food composition, different agricultural practices are impacting food composition, different processing techniques impact food composition. Um, so this metadata is really important. Uh, we are also working with other groups to have a uh, ontology that is um, aligned with the global ontologies for agriculture, for nutrition, um, and different food system aspects. Ultimately, the data will be available to researchers um, in the PTFI database. And uh, we are launching, we expect to launch the database uh, for research use um, in one and a half years uh, from now. Um, we are also uh, working to integrate the data with existing food composition databases. Uh, this includes the USDA's Food Data Central, which is the most globally used food composition database uh, currently. Um, and then uh, for clinicians um, and dietitians, we are also integrating the PTFI data in AHA's precision medicine platform. Um, so researchers can integrate the biomolecules to look at relationships to um, human health outcomes for specific clinical interventions that they are leading. Um, and an exciting uh, new development of our initiative is that we're expanding our analytical pro uh, protocols to not only look at biomolecules in food, but those same food biomolecules that then enter the human uh, through protocols for looking at human serum and fecal matter. Um, and then lastly, it, um, our goal is not just to be a fascinating scientific research project, but to really translate that evidence um, you know, after we have carried out interesting research projects and doing big data discovery in the database is to really provide resources for data-driven solutions across the food system. Um, so just some examples of the types of research projects that we will be carrying out. Uh, what are links of soil health to human health? Um, how does climate change impact food composition? What are implications of modified food composition on human health? And then um, we expect this data really to be um, of interest to different sectors across the food system, from production, including agricultural guidelines, through processing, including product development, uh, food safety, 
um, and traceability guidelines, as well as labels, and then informing dietary guidelines, precision nutrition, um, and also thinking about compost, compost management and waste. Um, as many of the food parts that are wasted do have nutrients and thinking about their use either for diets or their use um, for compost. Um, and as I mentioned, really thinking about these solutions um, with a health equity framework. Um, so we would like the data to be utilized for designing precision nutrition and institutional diets but really taking into account the interplay of an individual's different socioecological characteristics and the food that they have access to. And so a key goal of populating the PTFI database is to really think about those foods um, that different communities have access to and are desirable and culturally relevant to them. Um, also, we anticipate the data to be used to monitor the nutritional quality of the food supply and help design uh, food procurement for national nutrition assistance programs, hospitals, schools, and other entities in ways that are accessible to all. Um, and then thinking about uh, agricultural practices and product formulation, um, can we produce food that is more nutrient dense and affordable using fewer resources, including land use resources and other limited resources such as water? Uh, the application of this data to inform evidence-based strategies for climate mitigation. Um, we're going to be in a position with the periodic table of food with the metadata that we're collecting to really begin to understand how things like increased precipitation or droughts are impacting food composition and how different agricultural practices such as agricultural diversification or shade management is impacting food composition um, and begin to promote those practices. And then um, Finally, highlighting uh, the role of this data can have uh, with behavioral change for consumers, but really providing the knowledge uh, for consumer empowerment. So, for example, um, addressing such questions that many consumers have. Um, how do I increase diversity and nutrient density in my diet in affordable ways? If I transition to a heart-healthy plant-based diet, what do I need to be aware of regarding nutrient needs? Um, is organically produced food more healthy? And when does it make sense to pay more for organic food or local food? Uh, and just leaving um, with this quote, um, creating healthy food environments is not about telling people what to eat or putting the burden of dietary change in individuals. Quite the opposite. It's about ensuring that healthy food choices become the default, most attractive and affordable ones, empowering healthy, tasty, sustainable eating patterns. Um, and this is what we are seeking to do at the Periodic Table of Food Initiative. Thank you. I will be happy to take any questions if I have time. Thank you for inviting me. I am a plant doctor. So now you're going to get sort of the other side of things. Um, and it's great to follow Selena. Um, she's already disclosed that we are one of the funders of that project at FAR. Um, so I was trying to think about you know, how to put this together, this talk, and I thought that I would start by maybe looking at the history of our food system and how we got here. So I want to try to tie it back to then some of the issues and challenges. So if I can really go to the first slide, um, I want to talk about the food value chain. So I want to start with post-World War II and how our agricultural system developed. And think about it, fortunately, none of us were around then. Um, but, you know, we were coming out of the Depression. There were a lot of food shortages and issues around food. And then we had World War II. There was a lot of rationing of, of food as well. So think about, like, how we would all be if there was no coffee. So pretty, pretty irritable. So, yeah. So, so some of the real drivers of where we got to was really um, looking at technology advances. So there was a lot more mechanization that came about post-World War II. Um, used to be that agriculture was really dependent on labor and animals. And you know, there used to be a lot of oats grown in the US primarily to feed the horses that were required for, for agricultural production. As well, a lot of people lived on the farm and it took a lot of people to produce food. 
but that really changed with mechanization, also with crop inputs. So about the same time, fertilizers, pesticides became very prevalent, and as well, improved genetics. And those improved genetics really came about in parallel with all of these other things, mechanical har um, harvest, mechanical planting, use of tractors, use of pesticides. So we really developed a very efficient food system. So the, the word I want you to remember is efficiency, okay? Very efficient. Um, then there was also changing farm policy, and policy does Im impact on a lot of different things. So the school lunch program actually started in the 1940s. And if you think about that, and then we also started to produce surplus food. And so we had the surplus programs and things like that happening as well. So, but again, our farming systems developed on efficiency and scale. And then there's um, the rise of the middle class after uh, World War II, shifting diets. These trends are still continuing. Role of the consumer, um, particularly looking ahead, the consumer has a lot of say on food companies and, and what they would like to see happening. And then as well, globalization and supply chains. And think about, you know, I'm a baby boomer. I grew up in California, but we eat differently now than we did when I was a kid growing up. We ate a lot more frozen food, a lot more canned food. You don't see a lot of that stuff as, as much anymore. So um, I think COVID really showed us how important that school lunch program is nutritionally, particularly for um, economically disadvantaged children specifically. So um, this shows basically, if you look at, at the um, number of farms and the average farm size from 1900 to about 2002, and this is uh, data that I got from the um, Economic Research Service, part of the USDA, um, you see a big shift happening around 1960, 1970, okay? And then as well, we see a shift from farms really producing a lot of diverse crops to really getting down to, in 2002, maybe one crop, maybe two crops. And, and I wanna emphasize that as I talk about sort of the corn value chain. So primarily in this country, in the Midwest, we have two big row crops, corn and soy, okay? And those dominate our acres. I think uh, you said 90 million acres, give or take? Yeah, yeah. And so, but the point here is we've developed a food system based on the fact that these main crops, almost every part of that crop gets used, okay? And so trying to increase diversity requires that you think about where all of the parts of that crop are gonna go and how someone is gonna capture value in the food system. So primarily with corn, um, animal feed use, industrial use, bioethanol, and, oh, there we go. So, they're just sharing okay, the okay, yeah. So, so if you look over on the far um, right-hand side, of, yeah, right hand side of the slide, you can see all of the entities that are involved in all of where the stuff that corn comes from is used. But as you get down to the um, packaged food and beverage companies, the animal food producers, and then the restaurants, okay? So this is where corn, which is, you know, let's say 120 bushels an acre on average, it's a lot of corn. It's our most abundant crop when it comes to yield in acres. So it really dominates a lot of what happened, okay? And I think what I'd like to point out here is with this growth in corn and the availability of inexpensive stuff coming out of it, high fructose corn syrup, okay? Evil. We'll get there. <laughs> but, but again, it's a very inexpensive and abundant source. Now I can't, oh, there we go, okay. So this is soy, the other most abundant crop. And again, every part of this gets used as well. So corn is primarily a starch crop, okay? So starch yields bioethanol and sugar, 
a little bit of protein, a little bit of fat but, or, and oils, but not so much. Soy is primarily a protein crop, okay? But it has oil and meal. So this shows on this right side where all of this goes. So again, the restaurants, the packaged foods, and primarily all of this goes into animal feed. So I think where I'm going with this, or what I'd like you to think about is the fact that in the US at least, we've developed a food system that was primarily designed to, for calories, inexpensive food, and to fill people up. And I, I think if you uh, think about you know, the size of people in the past and the size of people today, our nutrition, even though here we're talking about the fact that maybe it's not so good, it's better than it's ever been in reality. And you know, I don't know if you read Steven Pinker, but Steven Pinker really argues that, you know, while we think things are horrible, they're really better than they've ever been, even despite all of the bad stuff that's happening. So, um, so I'm gonna say maybe the food system isn't necessarily broken. It's doing what it was originally designed to do, but the point is, is what it was designed to do, what we need it to do in the future, and does it need to be disrupted? And I think, you know, um, if you look at we are, what we are eating, and I want to point out the stuff on the bottom of that. So, so I'm going to say that maybe, my other take home, convenience is bad for you. You know? Because everyone has the same 24 hours. And so, you know, we use fast food a lot. We use DoorDash. We go out to restaurants to eat a couple times a week maybe if, you know, we're stressed. So, a lot of that food that you get in restaurants or that you order through DoorDash has high in sugar, high in salt, high in fat, the things that cause us to like them, to feel maybe full, but maybe not so healthy. And so this uh, I basically got from the American Heart Association about metabolic syndrome. And um, I had the pleasure of being in Davis a couple weeks ago at a, a food, um, uh, summit, and uh, one of the presenters was um, a pediatric professor emeritus from UCSF, Bob Lustig, who's written uh, several books on metabolic diseases. So, so a couple of the takeaways I got from that, which really, you know, m made it very clear. So he started talking about the fact that a lot of this metabolic disease, you can trace to when it really started to happen with the rise of particularly high fructose corn syrup, the inexpensive cost of sugar, and the food manufacturers putting those kinds of things in because they were an inexpensive source that they could put into the prepared foods. And a lot of our food practices shifted towards convenience and using a lot of those prepared foods. Um, so I think um, the other thing that, that he showed, which I found quite fascinating, was you can be obese and you can still be metabolically healthy. And it has to do with, he showed some great pictures of where fat's deposited. And so his point was, you know, take good care of your liver because it's the liver that really maybe pushes you into some of these metabolic disease problems. And the other thing that uh, he talked about is feed your gut. And so we know that particularly um, starches that are slower digesting and get to the lower gut are the ones that and really affect good gut health, the good for you, like bifidobacter and things like that. So um, now about far. So I should sh share that I didn't have, I have a disclosure site at the end that my communications people put in there so it doesn't say too much, but you know, FAR is a 501c3 nonprofit and so we're funded by Congress so the opinions that I just shared are based on my 30 years of working for big ag in the past and don't necessarily reflect the views of FAR, okay? And no one is really paying me to say any of that stuff. So um, FAR essentially is a research granting agency established by the US Congress. We get our money from Congress. Um, and they set us up really to leverage the public dollars with 
private dollars. So for every dollar that we award in research grants, we need a matching non-federal source of, of dollars. So we really are focus our research on enhancing viability of farms, food supply, increasing environmental resilience, and improving human health and well-being, and then developing the scientific workforce for food and agriculture. So we do that by making competitive grants, direct awards, prizes, and public-private partnerships or consortia. And I'm actually the manager of one of those scientific program directors for one of those consortia across the future. So when Congress established us, it was to be complementary but not competitive with the other federal agencies to fill critical knowledge gaps, increase public agriculture research investments, focus on actionable, translatable science. We are really geared at trying to get things out to the hands of growers, producers, translate results into available solutions to these partnerships. So we fund research across six different challenge areas. And this is where I'm going to tie it into the environment as well, because you'll see that you know, sustainable water management, soil health, really look at, at primarily the environment. But you know, in next generation crops and some of the others, we cross amongst some of these challenge areas. But I want to, for this talk, focus primarily on next generation crops, health agriculture nexus, and advanced animal systems. So, Got to get my notes out here. So for uh, next generation crops, we focus on diversification, because remember I told you our system is really based primarily on corn and soy, some wheat, some other crops, but corn and soy really dominate. Um, resiliency, accelerated breeding methodologies, that's to get new stuff into the hands of growers sooner. It takes typically eight to 10 years by the time you start doing the research to the time that you get a new variety out into the field. And as we start to wrestle with climate change, you know, we're breeding and testing crops today, right? But we actually need to be breeding them for what the conditions will be like eight to 10 years down the road. So that creates a challenge. And then this novel, nutritious, profitable, and resilient farm crops. And so, you know, our old agriculture system was yield per acres. I think growers now are more focused on profit per acres, and that allows them to really think about how they can diversify what they grow on farm as long as there's a profit to be made. Urban food systems, I think, is another thing that, that really comes back to some of the conversations that we've been having, and that really focuses on economically viable production systems, production practices in and across food and social networks, systems level solutions to, uh, for food and nutritional insecurity, and urban resource management. And then I just wanted to give a couple of examples of a couple of the things that we've funded in this area. So one of our programs is called Tipping Points. And that was from far $4.4 million, um, and the money went to um, groups in Colorado, Michigan, um, New York, Ohio, and Texas. And it's really focused on research to improve interventions designed to enhance community food systems. Another, some of the other work that we funded is on looking at establishment of community gardens in urban settings, and really, you know, kind of what some of the dynamics are behind that, what would be the crops that people would choose to grow, and how that would work. The health agriculture nexus, and this is where our investment in the um, periodic table of food resides. So looking at increasing access to healthy food, reducing and redirecting food loss and waste. So we have two choices with the increasing population. We can either produce more or we can waste less. And you know, one of the things that I was thinking about as we were talking about the school lunch programs and things and the fact that I think the dietitians have made very healthy lunches for the school lunch, but maybe we need a study of what actually gets consumed and what goes in the trash because eh, the kids maybe, you know, are gonna eat the better stuff and maybe throw the apple away, even though the apples are probably better for you. So advancing plant animal production systems, breeding better nutrition, improving processing, packaging technologies. Again, those allow for uh, less waste, but also better for the environment when we start to think about some of those things. And then predicting supply and demand 
for crops and food animals. And um, one of the things that we funded through this is the breakthrough challenge that we're doing with GAIN. And this is for screening underutilized crops to develop um, predictive models to determine uh, crops usefulness as a source of functional ingredients or nutrients. And that was about $1.4 million in awards. So some of the other things that we're focusing on in some of our other programs are looking at um, hemp as a new crop for large scale production, primarily as a fiber crop, but also looking at across the value chain. Um, hemp really has a great um, profile of protein and is really high in omega fatty acids. And then, um, you know, I wanted to give a shout out to our friend here from soy because uh, the soy people have been working on high oleic soy, so trying to reduce the saturated fatty acids. And, and I think, you know, one of the things if we talk about regulation, so the government regulated that there would be less trans fats in the food system, and that really forced the seed companies and the food companies to really change what they're doing. And, and you know, McDonald's, who I like their french fries, well, they actually worked very hard to change the composition of the fryer fat to go to a non-trans fat um, frying mixture, which actually not only benefited them from a health standpoint, but they actually can get more, more uh, fryings before the oil goes bad as well. So it, it actually helped their bottom line. And I think, you know, one of the things that gets companies to do things is from their consumers getting pressure, from the government regulating it, um, or some way that they are financially incentivized. So you, without being too cynical, I don't see companies often doing things unless you know, there's, there's something in it for them as well from their bottom line. So I think that's my last slide, and this just says that FAR is a 501c3 nonprofit.